Greetings, physics enthusiasts. Welcome to AP Physics 2, Unit 7, Lesson 2. And I am calling Unit 7 Advanced Topics, which just means all the stuff we have left, little pieces here and there. I have a very funny story. I think it's funny about the word advanced. So um, if you ask me in person to tell you the funny story about the word advanced, every time I hear the word advanced, I kind of smile. I'm not going to tell it to you here on the video, but if you ask me in person, I will tell you what I think is a very funny story. All right. So today we are going to talk about energy. And We've talked about energy a lot in our time together in AP Physics 1 and AP Physics 2. And one of the things that you might be savvily uh, wondering is, what kind of energy is he going to talk about? Because there are a lot of different kinds of energy. Um, we talked about mechanical energy, and we talked about non-mechanical energy. What do I mean when I say mechanical energy? You know that we said there was kinetic energy and there was potential energy, both of which are mechanical energy. But there's also non-mechanical energy. And just the kind that we've talked about a lot in this class is heat. Um, so anyway, lots of different kinds of energy. Um, and we talk about how energy can change from one kind to another kind. If there's the uh, something up high on the top of a hill, it has gravitational potential energy. And as it goes down the hill, it speeds up. So that gravitational potential energy turns into kinetic energy. And then as it gets to the bottom of the hill, if it slides along, it slows down and slows down and slows down and slows down and stops. Where did the kinetic energy go? It got turned into heat. So the number of joules of energy at the beginning is equal to the number of joules of energy at the begin. I'm sorry, the number of joules of energy at the beginning is equal to the number of joules of energy at the end. And we call that the law of conservation of energy. The energy sticks around, but it might change from one kind to another. Now, I might amend that law a little bit later on. So the kind of energy we're going to talk about today, if we have you know, a particle, what kind of energy does that object have? Well, if it is um, spatially above or below the place where we call gravitational potential energy equals zero, then it might have positive or negative gravitational potential energy. If it is in an electric field and, it, and it's a charged particle and it might get pushed by that electric field, we might say it has electric potential energy. If it's moving, we might say it has kinetic energy. There's a new kind of energy I'm going to talk to you about called rest energy. Well, if it's at rest, then it probably doesn't have kinetic energy. But a particle at rest even if it's at a place where we say the height equals zero, even if the particle is electrically neutral, so no electric or magnetic field is going to exert a force on it, then what kind of energy might this particle have? And the answer to that question is it might, it, it does have rest energy. Um, so rest energy is the energy that the particle <clears throat> still has, even if it's at rest. Now, if it were to start moving, then it would have kinetic energy and rest energy. It's not like when it starts moving, its rest energy goes away. It's just, it still has that energy. It's the energy an object has just because it is. Hmm. And here's the thing. 
in some um, nuclear reactions, which we'll get, we're going to talk about later. So maybe I should be talking about this later. Anyway, um, in some nuclear reactions, so chemistry kind of reactions, where we have reactants and then we have products. A couple things we say about nuclear reactions. We say that mass is conserved. All of the atoms that exist at the beginning still exist at the end. All of the atoms in the reactants, those molecules just get taken apart and then re-put back together into the products. It's like you're working with Legos. You've got a pile of Legos and you make something. And then you can call that the reactant. Then you break the Legos apart and you build something else using all the same Legos. The reactants and the products use the same building blocks. And that is true in terms of uh, the reactants and the products being atoms. But if we have what I said are nuclear reactions, which don't take place with atoms, but actually take place with nuclei, it turns out that all the matter that was there at the beginning might not be there at the end. Sometimes the mass, there's a mass initial and a mass final. And sometimes mass final is less than mass initial. Sometimes there's some matter that was there at the beginning that isn't there anymore. Where did the matter go? It actually, in some of these, now, not in big macroscopic, you know, rearranging the atoms equations, but in these nuclear reactions, sometimes some matter that was there at the beginning is not there anymore at the end. Where did the matter go? The matter in some of these equa reactions turns into, you guessed it, energy. So the rest energy is the energy that this matter could get turned into. Now that is a big thing because we've talked about the law of conservation of energy. All the energy that was there at the beginning is still there at the end. And all the energy that's there at the end was there at the beginning. But here, I'm not saying that. I'm saying there is some energy there at the end that was not there at the beginning. It was in this different form, matter. So we've had the law of conservation of matter. All the matter there at the beginning is still there at the end. And we've had the law of conservation of energy. All the energy there at the beginning is still there at the end. It might just get turned into a different kind of energy. But now there's this new thing, and it's called the law of conservation of not matter, not energy, but matter and that's an ampersand, believe it or not, energy. So matter and energy is considered one thing that can take on different forms. Matter can poof, disappear as long as it turns into energy. Energy can poof up here, ex nihilo, because why not say it in Latin, right? Matter can appear out of nothing, ex nihilo, but it's not really appearing ex nihilo, out of nothing, because it came from something, matter. Wow. So matter can turn into energy, energy can turn into matter. So what we need is an equation. And we need an equation that takes um, a certain amount of matter and says it can turn into a certain amount of energy. This equation is not correct yet. It is incomplete. What is the unit for mass? Kilograms. What is the unit for energy? Joules. So a certain number of kilograms cannot equal a certain number of joules. So first of all, we need some kind of proportionality constant here to change the unit. 
but I'm saying a certain number amount of mass, a certain number of kilograms of mass can turn into a certain number of joules of energy. And I would like to think about that from the lens. Let's look at units. Well, energy is in the unit joules. So, and this is in the unit kilograms. So my unit here, if I think of this as a fraction, must have joules in the denominator to cancel with these joules and kilograms in the numerator. So the unit for this proportionality constant The unit for the proportionality constant must be kilograms per joule. Some number kilograms per joule. This joule on the bottom cancels with the joule from the energy, and it leaves me with the unit kilograms, so I'm converting it to mass. Hmm. Okay. Kilograms per joule. But remember, a joule is just some you know, cisgender dead straight white guy's name that we use when we really mean kilograms times meters squared over seconds squared. Oh, so this unit is really seconds squared over meters squared. Interesting. Interesting. Or last or I promise, one over meter squared per second squared. Right, I flipped it over so it could look like the square of the unit for speed. So I've got one over, my unit is meters squared per second squared. Now, now all we have to do is an experiment and we say, hey, this amount of matter disappeared. Poof, it's gone. How much energy appeared in its place? And then, uh, you know, looking at this and this, we just look at what number we need to put here. And the number we need to put here, it turns out from experimental observation, the number is 9 times 10 to the 16th. Now, maybe that looks a little weird there to have that in the denominator, but um, that's just the way it worked because of where our unit had to be, one over meter squared per second squared. So maybe just because this is in the denominator, it would make sense to rewrite this with this in the numerator over here. So that's what I'm going to do. On my next piece of paper, I'm going to have E on the right, and then I'm going to have 9 times 10 to the 16th meter squared per second squared in the numerator over here. So that's, oh, and then what I'm going to do is instead of having the E on the right, I'm going to put it on the left, and this times M, I'm going to put it on the right. So, so watch. It's going to look like this, 9 times 10 to the 16th meters squared over second squared times M. Now, be careful. This M means meters. This M means mass. So just hold that in your mind. And then I'm going to switch the left and the right. So E equals 9 times 10 to the 16th meters squared over second squared units times M. This M is mass. This M is meters. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to write it big now on this new page. E equals constant 9 times 10 to the 16th meters squared over second squared times M. Now, there's a lot of things. You know, 9 is a perfect square. And of course, 10 to the 16th is a perfect square. Uh, 10 to the 8th times 10 to the 8th is 10 to the 16th. And so maybe this would be fun just for fun. What if instead of nine, I wrote three? Instead of 10 to the 16th, I wrote 10 to the eighth. Instead of meters squared over second squared, I wrote meters per second. And I squared that whole thing. Three squared is nine. 10 to the eighth squared is 10 to the 16th. And meters per second squared is meters squared per second squared. 
<gasps> oh, but you know what this is inside here? You know what that is? That's the speed of light. Isn't that fascinating? It's just what a weird coincidence. So E equals C squared, because this is C squared, times M. That is the equation we're looking for. And the fact that this number here with this unit happens to be the square of the speed of light is a really beautiful, amazing coincidence. But it doesn't mean that, you know, the matter is moving at the speed of light or anything, or the energy is moving at the speed of light. So this equation, E equals C squared M. What does it mean? It means that this is the rest energy. C squared times M is rest energy. In other words, if I have a certain number of kilograms of matter, because it's mass, and I multiply that number of kilograms by 9 times 10 to the 16th, that will give me the number of joules of energy that will poof appear when that matter disappears. So mass can turn into energy. Matter can turn into energy. It is common in our mathematical world to write a dependent variable equals some constant times the independent variable. This is the way that we would normally write this equation. And then we just gave this a name. We called it rest energy. Is this equation commonly written this way? No, it is not. I don't know why, but we usually write this equation, E equals, we put the M first and the C, we usually say E equals MC squared. Oh, that sounds familiar. I know it sounds familiar. I wanted to say that to the very end. But really, it is most common, right? You know, Y equals MX, right? We usually say our dependent variable equals the constant times the independent variable. That's what's going on here. We've got some amount of matter measured in kilograms, we're going to, mul if it disappears, we multiply that mass by 9 times 10 to the 16th meter squared over second squared, and we get the number of joules of energy that poof into existence. So E equals MC squared, not quite the way we usually say it. I wish we said E equals C squared M. Actually, I really wish we said E equaled 9 times 10 to the 16th times M. But there it is. So now we see that maybe sometimes we don't follow the law of conservation of matter because sometimes some matter disappears. Maybe sometimes we don't follow the law of conservation of energy because sometimes some energy appears. Yes, ex nihilo. But if matter disappears, energy appears in its stead. If energy appears, poof, that's because some matter disappeared. So we call that the law of conservation of matter and energy, this combined category. And that is our lesson for today. I hope you've enjoyed me sneaking up on something that um, that you already probably had heard before. Uh, did you see it coming? Did you know when I got there? Did you see it coming when it was there? When I saw, when I wrote nine times 10 to the 16th, did you say, wait a minute, nine is three squared and 10 to the 16th is 10 to the eighth squared. Did you see it coming? Or was it a surprise? Kind of a fun little question. At what moment did you figure out what was going on? Well, that's all. Um, so lots of laws out there, laws of conservation of stuff. Don't break them. Don't break the laws of physics. Bye for now.